Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, Brendan? Good. Thanks for doing this, Cormac. My pleasure, man. So My you're in, what's your the connection to New York? Uh, Do you live there? Well, no, I don't live here. I, <laughs> uh, I just ended up here. I just kind of go where there's racing and where people... That's literally the, that's literally the vibe I got. And I love your Instagram profile <laughs> where it's uh Rider with Candles, uh a couple sponsors, Irish American, World Traveler, then the home emoji question, question, <laughs> question. I'm like, wait, maybe he doesn't live in New York. Cause I was shocked when I saw you with good guys at GMSR is maybe gonna try and go up there. And yeah. uh I know Jake from way back in the day. And um I've only met I'm gonna butcher his name, Haken. Hakun, Hakun, Hakun. Hakun. Sorry, sorry, Hakun. He corrected me at uh, Capital Region. And so, yeah, I was hoping to get up there, but congrats on a great ride. Looked like an awesome Thank you. Race. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really expect it, to be honest. It just kind of, I wasn't uh, sure how I'd be going. I took a bit of a break mentally and physically after the World Championships and uh, just kind of went in with no expectations. But we had a fun squad. Um, you know, that's the main thing. We just we just had a lot of fun. And then that also ended up in us getting a result, a result, excuse me. Yeah. So do you know the other Cormac or what's your connection to good guys? Yeah. Yeah. Good I guy. know him just through Instagram. And then uh, we met in California. They were having a training camp <clears throat> and we we had this awesome ride together with myself, Cormac, and then uh, a few other good guys like Jake. Castor was there, Hokun, um, I think, I can't remember who else, but it was, a, it was just an awesome ride uh, with like the worst California weather you can imagine. Oh, jeez. It's freezing. And, uh, but it was just good fun. You know, we just had a great time because we yeah. all were just like, I don't know, we just all got on well. And then they needed a rider for the Ross Talton in Ireland because uh, mm. Jake Castor was out. With an injury, he uh, crashed earlier in the year uh, pretty badly. So I took his spot to go to the Ross, um, and then we just had a great time. And I did really well there, and so I'm happy to spend time in New York. It's a lot of fun. I've never really been here until this year. So uh, and it's actually really good for training, I think. I think it's incredible really? for training. Really? Yeah. I would never guess that. Yeah, I mean, it's not like uh, – you know Girona or something <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah but you can get out of the yeah. city easily and enough routes to be happy with yeah I mean it takes you know just a few minutes to get to Central Park or whatever and then if you need to do anything you know two two to three hours that's that's plenty of uh road in mm -hmm. Central Park and it's just total stimulation the whole time mm -hmm. right like your brain just never switches off and it's like watching people and like looking out for horse-drawn carriages and stuff and like it's just it's but it's just a lot of fun you know because of that it's just entertaining um and then there's people you know you know you run into people all the time and just, it's like oh yeah sure i'll do another lap oh yeah sure i'll do another lap that yeah. kind of thing and then you can get out across to new jersey in 45 minutes uh to country roads basically um so yeah just the vibe for me you know i need to you need to enjoy everything in mm -hmm. life you know, otherwise you're going to put in all this work and then chances are it's, you're probably not going to win everything, you know, and then it's just going to feel like a waste, you know, so. The community aspect, I've lived in a bunch of different places where it's been, I mean, I live in a small town now, so there's very few riders. I go down to Florida where you go out on a four hour ride, you pass 400 riders, like the small <laughs> groups are 20 people. Yeah. If the I miss I Florida people. I can't wait to see you again um they're just super yeah. tight knit and some really fast people down there and then yeah like you said it's like you know you go to these races you get your teeth kicked in you're like ah I'm going home to a place where I'm by myself like this is rough you need to go back to some people to ride with so yeah for sure how okay. do you describe yourself as a rider because I was so like if you look at like pro cycling stats it's like oh this guy's a time trialist but then you're third <laughs> on right. on green mountain stage three and it's like so what who, how, that'll be the first question well kind of the, usually the podcast just starts who like how do you describe yourself as a rider who are you yeah well you know I'm uh what I've realized this year is that I thrive 
whenever there's chaos. Mm-hmm. I'm not a specialist. I'm not a climber. I'm not a sprinter per se, but just when things are chaotic and there's room for me to just slip into a move and, you know, the guys there will be stuck with me, then that's kind of where I, where I thrive. That's I like that. What's how did that play out on stage three? Uh, Cause I like you're surrounded by, how, were you guys going into the final climb or how did that, I saw just one thing on Instagram. Like, of course there's mm-hmm. no live coverage and it's you like slugging out like the race for third. And I mean, you beat some yeah. dudes up a hill. What, like, was it a big group or how did that shake out? Well, I, Basically, I had nothing to lose going into that day. I was on 19th on GC or 20th on GC going into that. I didn't have that good of a time trial. And then, uh, so I was sitting 20th on GC and I had nothing to lose. So I just went in the breakaway. Um, I was just trying really hard to get in the breakaway. You know, I lost my bottles on the gravel sector. My head was really just like, I don't care like what happens. Like I'm just going to attack a bunch and see what happens. And then like worry about getting a bottle of water later or whatever. Like that was my mentality. I was just kind of like, screw it kind of mentality. Um, so bring the chaos the early break. Is what you're saying, like find, find the chaos. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So okay. AJ was going nuts. Like he kind of, he was in the lead. AJ August was in the yellow Jersey and there was a pretty dangerous move that went up the road and he just smashed it up this climb, uh, incredibly hard. And, I think after that, there was a bit of a lull and then I went and it was just four of us at first. And then, um, that first time up that baby gap climb, uh, a group came up to us and uh, maybe we were 10 or 12, but once they caught on, uh, I just, I just sat on, I just sat there. You just waited. Yeah. Because I had nothing to lose. You know, I like, I could care less if it came back and I wasn't going to beat those guys anyway, if I did work. So right. I just sat there and, saved and, it. I, and wow. yeah, I saved it. Kudos. Yeah. And then it ended up third <laughs> on GC. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause it's the same thing happened to me earlier in the year, you know, I, I was in, so in the Ross Talton, I was fourth on GC going into the final day. And then the, there was a breakaway somewhat early, maybe an hour into the race with a bunch of GC guys, a bunch of guys going for the stage win. It was a huge break, maybe 20 guys or so. Um, but, you know, everybody's telling me like, oh man, this is your race to lose and that kind of thing. And I'm, mm. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, oh, okay, I'm going to take an extra long pull and like just getting way too into it uh, with my head, you know, way, uh, focusing way too much. I'm in the virtual yellow. I'm in the virtual yellow. And we got to these circuits uh, at the end, it was, we had to do a few laps. I can't remember, but it was a very challenging technical circuit. And as soon as we got there, the you know there was no more uh, kindness or cooperation in the group, and everybody just you know slit my throat. Right, like it was just uh, you know. So that that kind of thing happened to me before. Um, I was in a different position this time around, but I knew like there was there's these GC guys like you had to Owen. Uh, it's like C.S. Bellow, Owen Wright, who ended up winning the race. And then uh, Chris Prendergast. You know, you had these guys that were up on GC that are like, yeah, 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 this is my chance. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to beat A.J. August. I'm not Because they're not going to beat him up to climb. Mm-hmm. So I just let that play into my hands, you know. That's awesome. It's but like, I, I couldn't know, beat them up to climb still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Using the brain. It's, you know, that's a huge part of it. I think it's overlooked a lot. And especially, I, I mean – stage races can get so chaotic when it's like who's up the road who's coming back you really got to know what's big picture going on um i find that very difficult sure. and so yeah kudos thank you Let, man. let's uh jump into some of these questions so for context uh do you have a coach or are you self-coached yeah i have a coach uh i do not work well with self-coaching i tried that once um and it just what was your experience with that Basically, uh, you know, I, I actually, I've coached people in the past and I actually have a lot of fun with it. But then when it comes to yourself, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. I think even if you're the most educated person ever on coaching and you know everything, like you still need someone to bounce off of. You still need guidance, I think, or at least communication. You, know, you can't really have that conversation with yourself too easily i think um mm-hmm. so i think it's, it's just a really useful thing to have mm-hmm. someone else kind of i always like 
I think a guy, a friend of mine, Owen Shot, he uh, is a coach, but he also has a coach. And he's like, man, surgeons don't operate on themselves. He's like, and I'm not saying I'm a surgeon. He's like, but I just can't do it on myself. And I've tried my, I've tried it twice and I have failed miserably. And, and it's missing that conversational piece. And it's like, I don't know what it is, but when I'm in the weeds doing my own workouts, I can't step back. And when I try to, then I have, you yeah. know, things that I'm, that I, prefer to do versus what I should do. And it's like, you can tell yourself stories and it's just like, it's just, it, I'm never my fastest <laughs> coaching myself. It's, it pisses me off because I'm like, this is terrible, but it is what it is. All right. Well, that's good context. What's uh, so what do you like? What's your bread and butter? What do you like the most that your coach puts on your calendar where you're just like, you just like that workout, that ride, whatever it might be. Yeah. Well, I mean, definitely zone two. That's probably what I ideally I'm just doing bunch of zone two rides in between races you know that's that's my ideal season um you know this season i really raced more than i ever have um maybe not in terms of volume like big stage races or anything but just the amount of kind of finish lines i had a lot a lot of crits a lot of that kind of stuff but just every weekend being like all right where am i going next where's the next race Mm -hmm. um but yeah i like i like zone two and then i I like kind of you know i like fun kind of my coach calls them sprint intervals where he gives me these kind of five minute VO twos that are either preloaded with sprints at the beginning of them or at the end of them, just kind of stuff that hits a lot of different zones and you're just kind of, kind of messing around, but it almost feels like a race simulation type mm-hmm. thing. Um, those sessions feel really good to me when you nail them and when you're flying and, and they also kind of, they are good feedback. If you hit them well, you know, you're mm-hmm. like, wow, I'm flying right now that kind of thing so that's a good point about the racing a lot so would you do maybe one workout outside of the races during the week and the rest is zone two or do you just do it based on feel or like you guys chat and you're like yeah i'm pretty actually banged up from this weekend let's just keep it zone two and i'll go race or how would you describe that like uh when do you go hard when you're not racing yeah um it depends on the kind of racing that's coming up for sure obviously a big stage Mm -hmm. race you know you, you wouldn't be doing as much um, just training in general, but, uh, yeah, one or two big workouts, it maybe I'll still train through a lot of these races with the goal of just being super fit and then maybe targeting something later down the line. But yeah, if I'm doing a lot of crits at the weekend and that's, it's only a crit at the weekend, I'll, I'll do a few intense workouts and, you know, a long ride, even a long ride the day before the race. Sometimes that's, that's when I feel the best. Mm. Um, you bring up a good point of like, training through races because i think a lot of amateurs that will listen to this or people who are getting into racing might not understand that concept of you can't be doing a taper for every race or you're never going to be at your peak fitness when you do have the big a race coming up whether it was world championships or you might say the irish national road race do you have a particular type of taper that makes you feel good that you like to do people are always curious about tapers for some reason yeah tapering is tricky Really, I mean that's 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 almost the hardest part of training, in a way. Um, I mean, I, I I usually just leave it to my coach, right? But because uh, <laughs> it's just it's too much. That's what's that's where the brain really yeah. You know, tricks Did itself I do up. enough? It's, Did I not do enough? Should I do yeah. another one? Should I go? Should I do <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd say um, yeah. I mean, it's just it's just about keeping the legs hot. You know, like your legs are, uh, you know, they, they want to just relax. They want to be tired, but you're, you're kind of keeping them at gunpoint and like, Hey, like this isn't over yet. Like you need to, you need to be good for this race. Or I know we've done a bunch of training, but like, you know, <laughs> you need to stay with me. So it's, it's that finding that balance, right. Of just how hard you smash it. Like maybe doing a, a bit of intensity. I like doing a few intense workouts for sure. Leading into a race and then cutting back on the volume. Yeah, that's kind of generally what I'd be doing. I love that, that of keeping the legs hot. I've always used the word sharp, but I think hot sounds so much better. Like it's at, like you keep them hot at gunpoint. That's I might be stealing <laughs> that from people. Uh, what yeah. do you? What metrics do you usually follow for training? Heart rate, power, RPE, a mixture of them. Is that like influenced by your coach at all, or kind of what do you lean on? Yeah, well, it's it's fun to just do a mixture of both. Um, you know, I always think of heart rate as as uh, the output like power is the input like okay i'm doing this many watts and then my body responds to that 
mm. how it's my heart rate in response to that wattage. And that gives you signs about how you're feeling or maybe what's happening in your body, you know, if you're sick or if you're tired or if you're fresh or whatever. Um, so I think about heart rate usually in that way. Um, and then RPE, you know, usually when I do a zone two ride, I like to, I like to just flip away the Watts and just flip away. Nothing, maybe look at the map for an hour mm. and then I'll kind of flip to it and just, just to gauge how I feel or how, what kind of wattage I'm doing or, um, so I, I like to do that kind of thing. Obviously, intervals and stuff, I'm always using the power meter. Okay. Um, but racing, I wouldn't look at anything at all. Nothing. I'd just look at speed, time, and distance um, because all that other stuff just gets in your head. And it's also irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. I, I've, I love that because <laughs> I've actually had a teammate before that was like, well, I pulled out. I, I like basically said he stopped going hard because he was about to set a max heart rate. And I was like, I, wait, what? Do you seriously? <laughs> Why? How did you even yeah. see that? And let alone them think like I, I'm gonna explode. He's like, well, no, I thought I was gonna blow up, and I was like, dude, just race, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like that was the move. I mean, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like, uh, you know, I'll use it just to. Maybe if you're on your own, I'll use it. If I'm on yeah. my own, I'll use it. But if I'm in the peloton, there's literally no point in using it. Yeah. Cool. So. What's off the bike in the gym or not worth it? Um. Yeah, I'd say it's it's probably worth it. It's not something I do a lot of because um, it's it's basically, man, it's just work, right? It's like you're in the you're in the office, genuinely. You know, like people make the joke when you're out on the roads, you know, out in the mountains. Oh, another day in the office. You know, but it's like, you know, that's you can't call that an office. You know, that's that's too good. But so like the gym, yeah. I mean, it's I think it's great. Um, that's a goal of mine this winter is to do a bit more time in the gym i also do a lot of stretching and yoga and that kind of thing i think that's critical for our performance on the bike and mindfulness and just yeah so relaxation. actually going on that what are the other things that you consider off the bike part of be, like going to work that are in the office so gym work the foam rolling like what are the little things because i i these don't always get talked about but they're so important yeah uh networking ah networking is huge if you're a young cyclist, you know, you gotta, you, you the mistake so many people make is just, you know, like at a race, for example, Bose is one of my favorite races because it's a kind of European style race where everyone's in the same hotel, all oh. the teams are in the same hotel. So it's just great for seeing people and networking and that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, you're probably, you might be better off, your career might be better off for, if you if you're downstairs in the dining hall for an extra hour chit chatting than if you are up in your room foam rolling you know what i mean <laughs> a lot of young guys make that mistake you know it is so funny i was making a video and i was talking about just go talk to people i think when i was in my 20s i was so nervous and so intimidated by other riders that it was like i went i raced like even if i did well it was like i was just nervous to talk to other people and yeah, huge, huge mistake. Um, not only from, I don't think I was going anywhere besides amateur racing, but just the friendships and the opportunities to guest ride with people. And right. I'm 41 and I was able to ride with these guys in Ecuador from like friends I had, nice. made, you know? And so I was like, you get to go do a big race just because of who you knew. And so that's, a, that is a, that's like a clip network with people for anyone younger out there. It is who you know, and it'll take you super far. So I appreciate you bringing that up for sure. What's uh, training wise, group ride, solo smash, combination of the two, what kind of keeps you taking along? Yeah, uh, honestly, I do most of my training on my own. Um, maybe there's a few select people I'd actually really train with, something I'd call training. You know, I, okay. I do like to just ride my bike for fun. And sometimes I think about it. Like today, I just kind of, I went out with some friends and it was kind of just, it's just that time of year where it's kind of low stress anyway. I'm not super concerned about the watts I'm doing or that kind of thing. But um, generally I'd train on my own just to reach my targets and do what I need to do to perform. Um, group rides, the kind of race race group rides are tough for me mentally. It just, you know, I, I always use the analogy that like, if you saw Conor McGregor in the street, and ask him to fight he'd you know like he wouldn't do it you know like he'd be like no you need to pay me like a few million dollars to do that right so i think 
that's that's kind of my mentality is like obviously I'd, i'm not getting a few million dollars to race but like i like to kind of i don't like to just do it for free <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> you know? so you that like, so my like, head just doesn't work that way you know yeah interesting. i can't like like when i go to a start line like even if it's just 100 bucks or whatever like it just it's like all right numbers are pinned on there's a bit of cash to the line like let's go yeah the group rides like oh, man <laughs> that's so wild i've never heard anybody say that and i that's huh i've you know i've heard people prefer not to do group rides like well i'd rather just do like a long endurance ride like i'm gonna go out like you know i just like because that's where people break off it sometimes like especially mm -hmm. amateurs they like just go smash too much with their bros and it's like they're stopped training but huh that's wild yeah. cool it's each his own well yeah and i think like a lot of you know there's so many people too there's a lot of young kids especially or older people it doesn't matter they they go to the group ride and they they kind of they exhaust themselves mentally from that right instead of focusing on the actual race like letting that kind of um competitive energy build up you know and saving it for when it matters and saving it for when there's a real situation be like that what am i trying to say like the the rules and the dynamic of a group ride they're not really they're not really accurate or they're not the same relative to a race either i think i think group rides are good for when you're when you're just starting and you're kind of just learning how to suffer I remember in uh, Durango Tuesday Night Worlds. That's kind of a famous group ride, probably the hardest group ride in the country, I'd say. Um, you know, Ned Overend and Howard Grotz, Pace and McKelvin, um, Keegan Swenson used to always be there. All these just insanely strong mountain bikers that don't know anything about road tactics are there, just smashing each other. And like, I remember that was instrumental because you just you just learned how to suffer. But then if you're out racing in the streets with a bunch of mountain bikers who don't know anything it doesn't make you a better racer i don't think uh, very true past that <laughs> <laughs> what's no so, offense mountain bikers <laughs> what races you're talking about not really worrying about the watts right now too much do you have any other races coming up or when do you start do you transition into like a base phase how do you look at like the next uh we're recording this in september 7th how would how do you look at like october november december let's say going into next year yeah uh well i actually i'm just gonna keep racing i have uh i was one of your few races that. this weekend yeah i have a few <laughs> i mean there's just races happening all over the world at any given time you know you could if you really wanted to and you set your mind to it you can you can race january through december mm -hmm. um no problem so i have uh, some racing in the northeast next weekend there's uh it's called tour de la paz this saturday it's like a guatemalan uh aid fundraiser I'm, i can't remember exactly i'm butchering it but it's a fundraiser for something <laughs> in guatemala <laughs> this weekend in new york so i'll be fun it'll be like a latino fiesta uh, here in New York and then um, there's Bucks County Classic and then I'll fly to Mexico to race with Canals Zero Uno in Zacapu which is uh, it's this d race that happens on Independence Day in Mexico um, it's like a kermesse basically it's 160k uh, you do four, 40 laps of a 4k course so it's just like a crazy party race it's like makes Tulsa tough look like nothing you know what i mean really okay <laughs> yeah. chaos here we go but, uh, bringing it yeah yeah and that i mean exactly it's chaotic there's street dogs and drunk people everywhere and um it's good fun and then uh after that vuelta ecuador and then vuelta guatemala happens i think it's in november and then vuelta costa rica which is in december Sick. so i, I have a you lot got, of you're not done there. yet no no, no, and I like it like that. You know, I'm a. At the end of the day, racing is my it's my bottom line, right? So I gotta just I gotta just keep doing it. Um, but also, I I just enjoy it. You know, I get kind of bored of training pretty quick. So, okay, so do you lay off the gas ever? Or do you just like do you try and go January through December, and just keep rolling? Yeah, I mean, I just I know when I want to stop. Mm. You know, like I know it. Like I'll just wake up one day and I'll be like, All right, I'm like. I need to take a break or, or I just, uh, accidentally do it. I accidentally kind of like after the worlds, I didn't really intend to take a break, but I think just all that, 
all the build up and everything um kind of accumulated to that one race and then I think mentally I was just kind of like ready for a break and I just I went out and I could just barely I couldn't barely ride more than two hours just mentally I wasn't there so mm -hmm. that's kind of usually just how it works yeah just let it all shake out as it is it sounds like it's working I mean which you prefer speaking of uh world's one day race or stage race stage races for sure yeah they're just so much more fun just with the I, I like uh, the team bonding that occurs mm -hmm. over a good long stage race. You know, um, like I race with good guys. Part of my function on good guys are, is that I'm bringing a lot of experience to the table. And there's a lot of young guys on this team that are up and coming. So, you know, I want to try and share as much of my experience as I possibly can. And I did a few crits earlier in the year with them, like Armed Forces Classic and but the, those races are just, they're kind of too crazy to be able to, you know, learn anything from them. It's, 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 I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say there, but you know, you just, you barely see each other in the bunch because if it's just, if you're not good enough, you can't, you can't do anything in that race except survive. Whereas in a stage race, you know, there's a bit more opportunity for guys to have different roles in the race mm -hmm. and kind of grow into a bigger role as well as just the day multiple day uh racing you know it allows more time for just doing stuff with the team and really i mean even just you know when you have a race and everybody just kind of meets there and then drives home afterwards you don't really have time to process what happened as a group and you know have a, a recap that night after everything's all kind of been formulated and and uh figured out in your brain um so I just, I think stage racing is just way more fun. That's a really... And long road races. Yeah, those two are amazing. That's a really good description like because I, I don't think most amateurs get that opportunity. And I've only been able to do a couple myself. And it's like, we went to Tour of Southland, the one in New Zealand was amazing. Oh, for cool. That reason. I mean, it's a lot of like same race hotels. You go to these little towns. There's maybe like three tiny yeah. hotels and everyone's there. And it was just like the group, we all, we were a composite team. We gelled pretty well. And it was, I mean, just a memory that I'll never forget. And the racing was incredibly nice. hard. And uh, yeah, so I think that's cool for people out there, they can get to a stage race. I mean, it is worth the time. I know people don't want to take off work or they have a family or whatever, but it's like, it's just so different. And I wish there were more opportunities for amateurs, but yeah, you really painted a really good picture of why people should try and experience that what's what's mm. one of like the number one things that's gotten you to where you are right now i mean dude you've been on some big podiums second at irish nationals uh i mean you're getting to race at the world championship like you're at a level that most people won't get to but what's like a some small things that you've found to be super helpful to get you as fast as you are yeah. Um, uh, well, I'd say, I mean, I'd say at, at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how fast you are almost as much as it is just being a good guy as, as being like a kind person that people want to be around being someone who wants to help and who, someone who wants to contribute. Um, I think, I think those are obviously you have to be strong you have to have the Watts, but I think, there's a lot of guys out there and there actually aren't that many, but there's a few guys out there that it doesn't matter how strong they are because they're just not pleasant to be around. Mm. Right. Like you can get, you can get really good results, but if nobody wants to be around you and nobody wants you representing their organization or their brand, then, um, you know, it doesn't matter. So I think just like we kind of already touched on, it's just so important. Um, going to race. I like to go to races, extra early and just kind of do laps and just say hello to everyone and check in. And that's, that's for myself. Cause I like people and I like talking about bikes and I like seeing old friends, but um, you know, it's also just really helpful to get information and learn about potential opportunities and um, you know, ways you can help other people too uh, with their racing organizations and their teams and their sponsors and whatever. So um, that's, that's something I focus on a lot, um, is just, you know, 
being present when you're at the race, not, not getting to like, not putting in the headphones and being like, you know, like nobody talked to me. Like I'm getting, I amped for this crit, you know, um, oh. actually that's actually hard. At, with, that's a hard thing for crits for me because everyone's all nervous and I'm all nervous too, you know, because the race is so intense, but, but, um, yeah, just, just being accessible, being, being present, you know, being willing to chat to people and being a nice guy, probably the most valuable things in this sport. I, yeah, man, I love your love for racing, but like you have it on a much deeper level than just racing the bike. Like there's so many, uh, dynamics to how you look at like the race day event and, the uh, from the networking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, man, it's cool. What, let, have you always been a cyclist? No, I, I learned how to ride my bike quite late. Actually, I think I, I didn't ride a bike until I was 11 for the first time. Uh, Where'd you grow up? Uh, in Seattle area. Okay. Around Seattle. Yeah. Washington State. Um, yeah, I started mountain biking in uh, high school when I lived in Colorado. And um, just loved that. You know, I, I lived in uh, Carbondale, Colorado which was just kind of like a funky mountain town with great trails nearby. And we didn't have any kind of community for racing. I, I did NICA high school league mm, yeah. mountain bike racing in Colorado, but um, you know, in the town I lived in, there wasn't really much culture of that, but it was just, it was just bike culture. It was kind of like, you know, there's all these old guys that like the bike shop, Aloha mountain cyclery. Uh, that was the bike shop. I used to like go and, hang out at and they would just you know go ride around up in the mountains wearing like crazy costumes and stuff and like messing around and like drink beer and it was that kind of like dirt bag single speeding culture <laughs> um so that, that was like just a great it kind of like durango colorado similar thing like chad cheney and that devo program it's just all about kind of having fun and not taking yeah. things too seriously and just learning to really love the bike before you dive in completely and want to be a world champion. Um, you know, that's, that's what keeps me going is that I think I generally just have an innate love for cycling and the bike and racing. That's awesome. You, you use the word uh, learning in there. What have you learned about cycling that's made you better about it over the years? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say uh, being one of my, the things that has helped me the most and that I continue to try and do every day and every race is to just be very open and receptive to feedback. Mm. You know, like recognizing that. when someone maybe knows a bit more than you and, uh, you know, being very open to and uh, investigative. <laughs> into what they have to say and their knowledge. I have a lot of mentors that have helped me. And uh, so being open to feedback from those people and, and searching those kinds of people out has helped me a lot. That's awesome. How do you, so do you like actively search out mentors in the cycling space? Uh, I wouldn't say actively, but I've just, I've had one mentor for a long time, John Sheehan. He's a ex Irish or Irish ex-professional cyclist. Um, and just, he's one of the most helpful people I know. He sponsors me with his bike company, Gerard Cycles. Oh, sick. Um, and he does bike fits and uh, all that kind of stuff. And he just is a wealth of knowledge with tactics. So he was really who got me into road cycling. And then some of my other mentors, like Matt Rice, my old director sportif on Jelly Belly and Wildlife Generation, and Johnny Clark, who I was really uh lucky to be teammates with for two years just those kinds of guys that have been around the sport for a long time and you know they've made they I know it now even at my age I'm getting to the age where I can look at young guys and see myself in them and be like god you're an idiot because <laughs> <laughs> only because I know only because I know you know because I was an idiot too so um yeah it's just just those those kinds of people um I wouldn't, I wouldn't be anywhere without them. I'd That's say. awesome. Johnny Clark actually lives down the road here. He lives in, um, got, uh, Lenore. Lenore. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm up in blowing rock and 
I passed this guy out in the gravel the first I was visiting here before I moved here. And he was in either a wildlife kit or something I'm like, who the hell is, wait, was that a wildlife kit? <laughs> I was like, couldn't have been. And then someone's like, oh, it's Johnny like kind of ugly dude there. in and a like, wildlife kit. Wait, Johnny Clark from UHC, like back in the day. And so I was actually, I saw him at uh Winston Salem crit. I was doing the master's crit and I was going to say, what's up. He was like, Hank, he was there super early. And then by the time our race finished, he was gone. I was like, damn, well, I'll cross paths him at some point. But yeah, so he's a legendary ripper, that's for sure. So Definitely. you talked about a lot of things that have made you faster. What are some things that maybe have slowed you down that you look back on and you're like, ah, eh, that didn't really work for me? Yeah. Um <clears throat> oh man, yeah, definitely. There's there's a few things that come to mind. Uh you know, I, I raced in 2019 for uh, this Irish continental team, Evo Pro Racing. Mm. You know, I was all G'd up from a great season on Jelly Belly the year before. And then I I um, went there and I just didn't have a good time. I didn't, I didn't perform well. Um, I was a bit too... I, I tried to be a bit too mathematical and focused and try focusing on things that maybe weren't necessarily things that were important like doing weird stuff with my diet or um just not focus maybe being like oh i can't go for a walk like a walk on the town because i gotta save my legs because i'm so i'm gonna just sit here and watch netflix instead of like go out and enjoy this like mm -hmm. awesome belgian city that i'm in something like that um so i'd say that year was probably one of my worst years just because of that. I, I, I was naive, um, but I, I kind of didn't acknowledge it. Um, so I, I thought I was hotter shit than I really was. And in reality, I needed to be surrounding myself with my teammates and just kind of being there along for the ride, you know, like Wolfpack kind of style and just yeah. For, like, yeah, focus on that. Um, and I think that that was that's another thing too is being a bit too selfish and not not focusing, not focusing on the importance of the bond of with my teammates and um, being an outsider, being an outsider on the team as well, making my turning myself into an outsider. I was only an outsider because of my own actions, mm -hmm. um, trying to be different uh, or thinking I was better. So that resulted in just bad performance um and then as soon as i i got out of that environment um i just i i was thriving it was partly the environment i think too i don't want to talk bad on the team at all it was it was a great opportunity but it was mostly self-induced mm -hmm. i then, appreciate uh, your i'd candor, say being self-coached I mean, too yeah. yeah that that's and i think what a lesson to learn and to be able like you said before though you were open to perceiving all of that that went down you could easily as you just said you could be like oh that was a horrible team it's like it didn't work out i had a crappy season da, da, da. but instead you're like no this is me and like what a growing experience that has to be looking back i mean it's definitely i'm sure made you a better person now for yourself and like that's incredible to have that uh i guess we'd say awareness to it all so man appreciate you sharing that what what's um Anything off the bike that you've had to overcome that you feel like has made you a better athlete? It doesn't have to be something negative or maybe maybe a, a triumph off the bike that has like uh maybe influenced your sporting life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um I mean the first thing I think of is I have a unique family. I have a brother with Down syndrome. So he's he's pretty uh he he's Down syndrome and he also has some other developmental disabilities so that he's He's the sweetest little guy on the the planet, excuse me, but um, he doesn't really, he's not really able to walk or talk, he's, but he's very easygoing and to, great to take care of and hang out with. But that, that just kind of has always motivated me to just, it, whenever I spend time with him, it takes me back down to earth, mm. you know, and it mm. kind of makes me just want to like appreciate what I have and what my body is capable of and what I'm able to do and where I'm able to go and who I'm able to hang out with and see. And, you know, that's, that's something I'd, I'd say that has influenced me a lot just as a person and as a rider and every way possible. I love that, man. 
That's yeah, that has to be just an incredible bond that you guys have too. I can only imagine that. That's uh yeah, there, you know, yeah. special things come from struggle. And so it's like, as you said, he's super happy and it's like it brings you back down. It and, is. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. What's thinking about uh maybe next year then of race season? Well, we can't really say maybe thinking of whenever you take a break and you like, all right, the next season starting since your season kind of just keeps going. What's something you want to improve on? What do you like? Okay, I gotta get better at this. Mm. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, man. Oh, it's a tough, it's a tough sport, you know, it's, to be honest, I'm, I'm a bit lost, you know, I'm not sure um, what else. I, I mean, I'd like to be better at sprinting, I'd like to be better at like bunch sprints, because I think I actually have the watts and the potential for that. It's just, it's just one of those things that uh, you really can't learn it. And I think in the past, I've been opposed to even trying, um, you know, I discount myself, you know, just like a guy, a lot of guys might show up to a hilltop finish and be like, oh, no, I can't, I couldn't do that, you know, mm-hmm. but I think um, that's something I'd like to be better at. So I'll definitely spend some time probably in California early season doing some crits and that kind of thing, focusing Wait, on that, I mean- trying to avoid the breakaway. <laughs> well, I mean, it goes with liking the chaos. You gotta like the chaos to want to go sprint, and it's, yeah, yeah. The reality is that unless you come in on your own, you have to sprint to win a bike race. So, hundred mm-hmm. percent. You know, I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. What's what do you think is? This is a tough question. Uh, I think I feel like it's a tough question. I usually ask people like, what's the best piece of advice that you've received, whether it's on the bike, off the bike, but it maybe just something I'm almost thinking more like what's something that like rolls with you that you've maybe think of often that, as you said before, like when you're with your brother, it keeps you grounded. Um, just something that like kind of keeps Cormac rolling. Mm. I'd say uh, just, having a good network of friends mm. and and just valuing that and i think that's that's one of the most important things i can think of and one of the most important things that for myself you know that really does genuinely keep me rolling is you know it's a lot of it is the competition but the other half of it is just being able to you know reconnect and connect with new friends and old friends um and then cycling too, you know, everybody that's in the sport is really passionate about it. You know, it's purely driven off passions. We're not all here to make millions of dollars. Um, so, you know, realizing that people are there to help you as well, you know, they, people want to help each other. And so not, not being afraid to accept that and also giving as much of it to others as you can, when you can when the opportunity arises, you know, be there for people. I like that. That's awesome. What do you do when you feel like you're, you're not riding well, how do you hit the reset button for that? Um, (laughs) I mean, what makes I'm curious, what makes you laugh? What what first came to your head when you, when you heard that? (laughs) (laughs) What first came to my head was this just this time earlier in the year where I just was having just shit luck and terrible sensations and sickness. And I think I think January and February had a great season. I was feeling really good. And then March, I was just not good. I got sick with something. And then March, April, April, I was kind of just like eh. I was decent at Redlands and then I got sick again there and I was just, I was at Gila and I was so bad. Um, but then just a week after Gila, we're doing Tour de Bloom, which is a fantastic race that I would recommend everybody to go to. Um, just going to plug that because Where is that's it? an incredible race. It's in uh, Eastern Washington. Okay. It's a, it was a four day stage race. Next year it's going to be five days. All the stages had rolling enclosure. I mean, like what more do you want? You cool. Know? So anyway, just wanted to say that. But I was at that race, and it was the final day, and just something clicked. Just like all of a sudden, my legs, I was just flying. I was, I was flying. And then two days later, I flew to Ireland to do the Ross Talton, or one day later, and then I 
I was there and I was absolutely flying again and um, I was still flying and I got second overall. And anyway, I guess, I guess just it's tough, you know, a lot. I think you just have to trust the process, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to know when you trust the process. And I think it's just, it's knowing when it's physical and knowing when it's mental Mm. kind of like what came first chicken or the egg, Um, Mm. you know, I'd say, I'd say that's, that's, that's the tricky part of it, but um, trusting the process. And then also for myself, if I'm, if I'm not feeling super good, I like to just, just make sure that I'm not just totally focusing on cycling, Mm. you know, just having other, just making sure that you're, you're uh, keeping yourself busy. Like I like to just go somewhere different. Maybe if I'm, if I'm not feeling good, maybe just go, go train somewhere else. Hmm. you know and just so that you're out training and you're actually enjoying it and exploring and i know that's not easy if you have like a full-time job or something but um you know you maybe you can apply that in a different way like you can just maybe go mountain bike instead of road bike or just kind of try and change up whatever your routine is just change something if if it's not working try and change something that's smart you're malleable you're not uh you know just stuck in one box so it's yeah it gives you options and i think fresh just keep things fresh somehow, you know? And yeah. That, yeah. It can be tough. A lot of, a lot of cyclists are very a type and it's like, I gotta do this. I think a lot of people will take away from this. Like I just, I can see people being like, Oh man, I need to <laughs> chill. Cormac is telling me to chill a little bit. It's, it's a good vibe that you give off for people. What's yeah. thinking more, more about uh, like the high performance aspect. What about nutrition on the bike? Are you a liquid carb guy, solid food guy? And let's actually break this up. Let's do your zone two rides that you like to do. And then let's talk about races. Let's start with the endurance rides. What are you doing for fueling? Yeah. So endurance rides, uh, I used to be a bit more kind of technical about it. Um, I used to make my own gels um stop there you know, with, well you used to make your own gels with what just like cane sugar and maltodextrin and you know make- like i <laughs> yeah yeah just literally like right before i go ride right before i'd go ride i would uh you know mix it up and you know do my 100 grams an hour or whatever what would you put it in thing. like a soft flask or something just a water bottle okay yeah just just mix it up make it a super light gel drink mix yeah, yeah. You know, Sweet. i know a lot of guys doing that and that that works you know i would still i wouldn't hesitate to do that in a race if i didn't have gels or anything because um you know it's carbs mm-hmm. it works right it's I'd, I'd say it's maybe not ideal for racing um you know one thing i think of is generally it's possible to lose bottles from your cages or uh you know, it's harder to gauge exactly how much you're consuming. Mm-hmm. So cool. Or you can, you, it's easy to consume too much and end up with a stomach ache or that kind of thing. So what have you shifted to now that you're not doing the DIY? Uh, well, for training, I, I kind of just don't think about it that much. I just kind of stop at a gas station three hours in and get a Coke and a cake or whatever. You know, I just kind of summon that like, inner manual labor kind of mentality just like like i like to think about it oh okay if i was a construction worker working my ass off in the sun you know i'd probably just like stop and get i'd be at a gas station or something and get a coke and like you know i I think about it like that like yep just another day like on the tools like working (laughs) you know you have such a awesome and unique perspective on cycling man this is like (laughs) i'm like a construction dude what would i do if i at this gas station i freaking love there's a guy james shout out to james i think you guys would be buddies like he's always like Uh not eating enough gas station food i watch you on instagram it's like way too calculated i'm like (laughs) what yeah that's hilarious Race, like day, gels, race I mean, if the, uh, let's talk about if the race is not yeah. passing a gas station what are you gonna bring, <laughs> what are you gonna bring with you <laughs> yeah well i i uh i actually just recently started working with this gel company that's just starting up called g5 performance okay. fields here in new york city made in new york city uh it's like a glucose based gel that's totally natural cordyceps um, in it for like increased focus and uh, matcha with caffeine and stuff. So that's like a really, really cool product there. Uh, 
actually going to be launching a signature gel of me, my own signature flavor that I got to choose Whoa. and name. Hello. So, uh, What's it going to be called? Give us the the uh, sneak preview. It's called uh, Super Calf 188. Hell yeah. So you got 188 grams of caffeine from matcha and 188 grams of, or 108 milligrams, 188 milligrams of not of definitely not 188 grams of caffeine. Okay. I was like, <laughs> damn, this is like, intense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, 188 milligrams of caffeine, 188 milligrams of sodium chloride. Um, and it's Coca-Cola flavor, which is my favorite flavor of gel or fav- the best tasting thing on a bike i think that's undisputable interesting so i like that i like g5 he makes mango also and uh apple pomegranate blueberry flavors and they're all super delicious and natural so i like having those and i like rice krispies that's what i have in a race any supplements that you take nothing what about it's only because i'm naive honestly I, i would be totally open to it but it's just it's kind of one of those things where you you like you don't really notice it, you know. So maybe maybe if you don't really notice something making a difference, it's harder to just stay in that routine. Oh yeah, especially when you're traveling and stuff. Totally, I definitely agree with that. What about but cycling? also just traveling? Is difficult. We'll talk about it. you travel a lot. How does that stress you out? I hate traveling with a bike. I would like flying. It, it, <laughs> I can't even. You must do that all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a bit of a system down, to be honest. Like, I've I've got kind of everything I need. Um, you know, I usually tr- I travel with two pairs of race wheels, and I got my tires and extra chain and extra seat and, you know, just that kind of stuff. I travel. I kind of have my system down to what I need. Um, so you bring two sets of wheels, so you're putting one in the box. You're just pat. You're pat. Uh, excuse me, I'm like can't think of the word. You're checking a bag of wheels. Yeah. How many? Ba- I mean, you must have a good system. That sounds like a lot of stuff that you're bringing. No, but- it's just one bike bag. I have one bike bag really? and one small carry-on roller suitcase and a backpack, and that. And but I have a. I mean, I I travel pretty light, like in the in reality, you know. But I I bring what I need. You know, I have my rain bag. I have extra shoes. I have extra everything. Um, So I don't know. It just kind of works. Cool. It all just fits in the bike bag. I don't know. I have a lot of like really kind airline people that don't check the weight of my 39 kilogram bike bag. (laughs) How how often does stuff break? Um, Knock on wood. Yeah. Never. Wow. Okay. Cool. I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, in the airplane, never. Yeah, interesting. I don't. I, I don't really I, do anything crazy. Either. Yeah, I must have. I just have bad luck. I had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry what's What's uh, Are you big into cycling tech? Um, in my own way. Um, what does that you know, mean? I'm, I'm kind of. I like. I mean, I like tubulars. Get out of here. Example. Okay. You know I mean? Like I'm kind of one of those guys all right <laughs> what's so what, what why do you still love tubular so much it just feel amazing they feel like you're floating and like you have complete perfect control when they're glued on well and you have nice tires yeah they're just perfect what tires are you using victoria courses okay that was the one thing i noticed at the world championships is that it was basically just the Vittoria Corsa advertisement unintentionally. It's like literally every single guy was on Vittoria Corsas. How many like, people wow. still ride in tubulars? Uh, I'd say more than, more than people realize in, in the world tour level. I mean, in local stuff, like literally nobody, everybody's on tubeless. Um, but I mean, yeah, still world tour teams are still using them. I'd say the majority of world tour teams, no? Okay. I could be completely wrong about that, but I no, I yeah, so. I don't, I'm not huge into cycling tech. I just kind of like ride what's there. So I I used to love tubulars, and I would glue them myself, and I was really into it. And then I just like it just became too much after a while. Like I just I hate <laughs> messing with my bike, and yeah, it just yeah, just fell out of love with that. But yeah, I get that. What do you think is underrated in cycling? Oh man, um, 
what's underrated in cycling uh probably just race tactics mm. you know just race tactics and honestly just like i'd say like experience you know a lot of people say they they look at some guy's results and they say oh he got like he did all these tours but he got 58th place that was his like best finish or whatever like all right who's this fred you know but you know that experience builds and compounds and it's worth a lot to just take part in these races and it's worth a lot to take part in any race and just experience it you know you can train all day in the mountains you know and with perfect training completely but when you get to the race you need to know how to handle situations and use your legs properly and not be stupid because mm-hmm. I see I see that way too much where guys they don't want to race the local crit that weekend because they're either scared of crashing or they they're they want to smash a session that they have planned and it's like first off there's probably like some decent money at the line for this bike race second there's it's like it'll be fun unless you just don't like racing <laughs> <laughs> and then and then uh you'll have you'll make mistakes you know that you can make in the small race instead of in the big race Mm -hmm. so i mean i i I feel like i need to just race constantly or else i I, you kind of just forget how to race Mm -hmm. or you get nervous you get more nervous before a race because you're not just in that flow yeah i mean you probably don't have this as much but i have always told people like man when i go to my first race in february march whatever when i'm pinning on a number after not racing for a month two months plus it's like ooh, this is a weird feel Oh man, I'm like getting butterflies and I like feel like this is my first bike race. Yeah. It's experiences experience is so underrated. And to your comment of like the 58th, I just think there's people that look at results and they think they understand the flow of a bike race based on first through 15th. And it's like, that's not there was a whole four hour thing that happened before the finish line and Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. so that's yeah it's interesting point even dnf you know you you look at you go look at my results from 2019 and europe and it's all dnf 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 or whatever but like there was there's a lot of experience in all those races like i still was there and i still was getting my shit my teeth kicked in you know like which is worth something learning something for sure but it's just a crazy level it's just a crazy level where like even even just to be there is an achievement totally big time what's on the flip side anything overrated in cycling uh overrated um hmm or even said that's a things that you can't believe people are wasting their time on (laughs) <laughs> that's the one way of saying it. <laughs> Fudge. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, I should have prepared more, I guess. No, but... man, we can, if you don't have, if nothing pops to mind, we'll, we'll, there's nothing overrated in your mind. They're like, yeah. But we'll, uh, there's the... a lot of stupid things that people do, though. <laughs> I'd, I'd say just like making training totally perfect like your training being absolutely perfect and like, you know, trying to calculate everything. That's, that's the most overrated thing, honestly, Mm. because it's just like, you can't, you can't put everything into an equation. There's just too many factors and life is complicated. Dude. Yeah. I mean, I think, as you mentioned, you've like helped to coach people for us. You've probably seen this. Like I go on forums a lot, Mm -hmm. just like answer questions. And we have a coaching business. I need like know what people are talking about. And it's the, People have people that have been doing it for like 18 months talk like they have the most experience. And then if somebody <laughs> like I'll read people and there would be a guy who's like clearly ridden a long time, raced a long time, he'll say something. And they're like, well, where's this study? And where is this like show me the exact this and this? And it's like, man, I just like kind of like sit back and watch it unfold. I'm like, this person has no idea what they're talking about. And they don't respect this guy who like, you can, I mean, you can easily Google someone and see what they've done for racing. And it's like, this guy has done so many races. Why are like, and it's just interesting when uh, people want to make it too precise, too scientific, too perfect. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's just not racing. That's just not endurance sports. Exactly. And that's why racing is cool. And that's like cycling is cool because you, you can make it precise but also that's that's why racing is so addictive and that's why it's so cool also because 
it's not just an exact science. It's not something you can just read in a book. It's something that you need to really just go out and experience and absorb and sl- suck up information yeah. as, where you can. My last question for you, what is, you've already given a ton of gems as advice, but maybe is there anything that sticks out that you'd pass along to the newer cyclist or the younger cyclist trying to come up? Um, or even, I mean, I, I sometimes have switched this question, like, you know, I'm 41, I'm still trying to get better. So to any cyclist trying to improve, what's something that you would pass along as you haven't already passed along? I mean, you've given a lot of really good tips. Um, anything anything that's like the one? And I mean, the one is just, just remember what it's all about. You know, remember why it's important to be alive and to do sport is to enjoy it yeah just make sure that that's what's happening and if if it's not then you know what are you doing what's the point unless you're making millions of dollars you know doing it then i think i think we need to make sure we're having fun but even then would you i'm curious what you think about that like what if you're making a million dollars but you wake up and you hate it i can't see i've known (laughs) you for i've known you for an hour and six minutes but i can't see cormac like really rolling that way maybe i'm wrong <laughs> yeah may, i don't know i guess i'm i'm not experienced in that regard uh <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, haven't, I, don't know. I haven't been in that position yeah well maybe someday i'll be curious to see what happens but yeah it's that, that's a tough i mean money is an interesting thing and it changes goals yeah. and ambitions and happiness and but yeah that could be a podcast on its own man thank you so much for doing this any anything we missed um or any closing words no, Brendan, um, no, I'm just super grateful for you reaching out and for being on the podcast. And thanks for having me. Oh, dude, thank you for taking the time to do this, everybody. Oh, that actually, my last question. You're on Instagram. Any other, do you blog, do you tweet, do any other? What's the best way for people to keep up uh, with what you're doing? For sure, I'd say the best way is honestly Strava. If you really want it, the instantaneous, you know, Sick. Cormac tracker, that's that's where it is you know it's all there i love i love strava and all my data is there all my power my watts my heart rate um you know i don't hide anything so go ahead and take a look at where i am and keep track of me what part of the globe i'm at and then yeah i'm on instagram i'm on instagram uh it's a cormac c-r-m-a-c-m-c-g-o that's my instagram cormac mick go we'll post the link below so if you guys want to go uh say what's up to him give him a follow hit him up on instagram Thank you so much for doing this, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon and good luck with your training and racing.